Talk about war. Talk about men being macho. Come on, you son of a bitch! I'll get you. Get off my Is there even a God? Are we doing His work? When are you gonna stop acting like a kid? Our country needs us. Needs us now. <sighs> You're a joke. Well, go on. Get out of here, then. It's a big change for me. Big change for America. There's stuff. There's more stuff going on than you and your wife. I'm excited. We're gonna win this war. I love you, man. I love you too. I'm coming back. You got well better.
Houston, we have a problem. I'm 35,000 feet in the air, and I'm fucking stoned! <laughs> God damn it, soldier! Bring that plane down right now! I want you to get that plane out of the sky, out of the ground, right now, soldier! Fly the plane! Fly the plane!
You can't be beat with a Dan Deacon over here with music for a soundtrack. No, I can't wait to you. Well, I'm you making the connection. Or Coppola? Well, as soon as he's done with Fran, he's going to talk to you. Well, I call, I call Fran's a soundtrack. You can do that. I'll turn it aside. Um, the other day, I sat down and watched both of your movies, and, uh, and I, you know, and I've heard a lot of hype and a lot of people talking about it, and I'm like, Usually, when everybody else likes something, I try to go against the grain. Like, when everyone's like, Smash Mouth is better than Nirvana. You're the voice of my generation. I was like, yeah, yeah, I don't think I'm going to avoid that. But then I went out and bought Smash Mouth Anthology, like a whole box set. <laughs> Tear, you know, uh, money out of the pocket, but tears down the face. Because I tell you, you know, those guys are the Count Basie of our generation. But anyways, I, I'd like to start. Well, I just noticed how absurd this tablecloth is. I can't stop staring at it. Wait, do you have any cats? Yeah, so you're gonna love the second half of the show. I know. Yeah. I didn't like what you did with the cat earlier. I had nothing to do with that, man. <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I don't. Now you should never be a dick to a cat. Or to us around them with disembodied penises. No, um, uh, he probably didn't think we're gonna be talking about this. <laughs> no, but in any event, what's, what's up with that tattoo? I like that. Is that a prison tattoo? Be honest. Person? Oh, prison. Oh, but it could be. That, no, that's that, that, prison tattoo. That looks like the Morton Salt Lady. She's looking for the salt, but she hasn't found it. But I know you found you were worth your salt as a director. And you, found it. <laughs> you know, and you also. Like, are you familiar with uh, Steve Merchant? You know what the other creature makes? You look a little bit like Steve Merchant, but you're a little less tall. I don't know. I don't know. But you, you should. Well, I, I know. A personal friend. I'll introduce you guys. Anyways, so I'll joke it aside. Um, when I, but I, when I watched your movies. <laughs> when I watched your movies, I noticed there's a lot of like twisting of the media. It's like you're going from film to document, from picture to freeze frame. You know, because in Putty Hill, there's actually like a kind of a meta thing going on because there's like a documentary going on within the film. And the documentary is like, it's kind of like ghost that's kind of this omnipresent character. What are you trying to like get out of the actors and what are you trying to achieve uh, with this kind of a method? Uh, I I don't know, I'm interested in cinematic realism, and, uh, but I'm self-conscious about it, because I think there's this implicit power relationship between filmmaker and subject, so I was like trying to uh, figure out a way to create a device that would acknowledge the fiction, but also let the subjects who are performing as versions of themselves speak in their own voice. So. <laughs> Well, I was actually, that kind of goes to my next question, because when I watch your movies, your actors, they feel really organic. Like, I feel like a fly on the wall, like I'm actually hanging out with, like, real people. It doesn't seem forced, like, when I watch, like, Soccer Cat or, like, Hockey Dog. Like, you know, they have to, like, uh, talking. Yeah, the acting's really forced, but when I watch your movies, which your stuff is better, better than Soccer Dog, I find, I find that there's, like, a level of intimacy and, like, personability in the movie like an authentic, like organic texture. How do you get that from the characters having such limited time to work with them? Like, how do you reach that point of intimacy with your actors? How do you get there? I, I know how I do it with my bandmates. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> he's straight and he's got a girlfriend. She's here tonight. <laughs> but it's okay if we did do that, but we'll never do that. The thing is, it's actually like, it's not, it's like, I don't have sex, I don't have sex with my no, cats, no, no. but you have or to, students, or anybody, yeah. But you have to... Well, some people, you gotta have sex with somebody sometimes. You gotta have sex with all the people all the time, right now. Oh. Where's that cat? Where's that cat? No, seriously, seriously, go ahead. Uh, it's like, um, you, you do, to a certain extent, really have to, I think, fall in love with your cast. Like, really love them, want to see them, want to be with them, and see them on screen, and share them with audiences. What if they're so, under 18? Right now, 16 will get you 20. I've worked with plenty of actors under 18. Well, that kind of goes into the next question. It's love, man. you got to love your cast. If you don't, then, then you can't work with them. So it's like lots of time hanging out, and then also... So you hang out with them before the movie set, like a few weeks yeah. before. Like, do you just like chill with them? you guys go to like friendlies and get a frivol shake? Yeah. That's all I roll, baby. That kind of thing, yeah. Chuck E. Cheese. Chuck E. Cheese. When I read Siddhartha in Canterbury yeah, Town. I've seen you there. So you, so you should. <laughs> I actually did see you in Finley's like a mom. Oh, no, no, it was the Lost City Diner. I love that place. Oh, yeah. That place is awesome. Everybody, let's give it up. Yeah. He plays, Thank you know. Support local business in the recession. The Lost City Diner. Great milkshakes. No and booze. It, yeah, but in, in any event, though, so you kind of hang out with the characters and the actors and you get to know them. And, and it seems like you actually give a damn about them, too. I feel like oftentimes, like when I watch Star Wars, like it's, well, you know, um, Harrison Ford has that famous line, like, George, you know, you can, you can write this stuff, but you can't read it. Yeah. You know, and it just, 
And especially like when Anakin, uh, when he's older in that one movie where he's like, I love you, I had a dream about you last night. I love you too. I'm going to stab Obi-Wan with my sword. Yeah. George Lucas is kind of like Robert Persson. He wants his actors to just be like, models. Yeah, yeah it, 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 but, but, like, it, but anyways, like, a lot of people don't know this about you, um, but you were a kindergarten teacher in New York City. Yeah. So uh, how many years did you do that for? Four years. That is really adorable, by the way. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, Four years of, of kindergarten. Making films, making tears go down the face, taking care of the kids. Did you ever have to change any diapers? Um, I've changed diapers, yeah. Well, no, no. yeah. We should tell again for the show. <laughs> no, I'm right now. Adult, adult diapers, oh my god. Adult, no, no. Well, but in any event, so it was like a fetish place where adults came in dressed like kindergartners. You worked in a bondage place, folks. No, it's true. No, but you did work with kindergartners, and I know that can be very testing on the nerves and working with kids. Like, yeah. I can't even, I tried to help my girlfriend out in the garden on Boone Street, and like kids like throw rocks at me and tell me I look like a tap dancer. And... <laughs> One kid the other day, um, he called me Tater Top. He's like, hey, what's this? He's like, what's up, Tater Top? And I was just like, oh, no, no, this kid, man. Yeah. At least he didn't call you a mime. Yeah, a mime, like David Bowie. Um, oh, and I also saw you, I saw you in that David Bowie movie, uh, Man Who Fell to Earth. Yeah, what did you think about that? I did get a bone. You did get a bone? I did not, I did not. People thought that I would. Anyways. <laughs> that was like, I'm fun. So anyways, no, but doing the kindergarten thing, because you have a lot of kids in your movies, and that's something a lot of directors aren't good with kids, because, like, they're at another, like, men, you know, adults are from Mars, kids are from Venus. But, now, well... Based on, a joke based on one of my favorite books, right. How I Feel the World Is. It's true. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Um, but anyways, um, no, but working with kids, you know, how did, does, did that cross over with your directing at any point, do you feel like? Those lessons you learned in the kindergarten room. Yes, actually. I think it, it, it's like, uh, you know, if you're, if you're running a classroom, uh, you want to create a safe environment so people are like, feel like learning and, and creating and taking risks. And, and, uh, yeah, you don't say like, hey, Fanny, get off the swing set. No, you should for that. You be kind. Yeah, you have to be kind. Yeah, it's it's the same thing, same thing on production. It's like, you want, want to make people feel safe. Yeah, no, Safety I mean, first. Well, okay, now, being, like I was going to, that kind of goes with the next question. Now, being on a DIY budget, you're kind of like doubling as a babysitter and as a director. So you have a lot of things to juggle, you know what I mean? But now, when it, when it, when it comes to kids, what would you say is like the craziest thing you ever had to deal with where you're like, ah, oh, this is beyond my, I, can, I can't do this. Like, what was like the most insane situation where you were like, throw in the towel, I can't do this anymore? Oh, um, I, had a, I had a baby, a uh, um, like an eight month old baby in my first film. Oh. And, and it was, so I had an eight month old baby. Like, and then he I doesn't had... talk, he doesn't remember his lines, he shows up later. <laughs> <laughs> she started crying. It, yeah, she doesn't get my Peter Falk jokes. Peter Falk's awesome, yeah. I was like, I want everybody, I'm a detective. I got one eye. I'm missing a friend, too, so it's okay. But anyways, uh, so it's not a weird joke. I wasn't trying to get dark. Speaking of which, you used to be darker. That's the name of your new film. The Michael Jackson documentary. That's right. No. No, but uh, okay, what's the most... What should you film again? What's the most? Sorry. It's it's in the movies. You, you have a shout. adorable. I love your face. You're a cute man. <laughs> no, Dan's like he's a cute guy. That's true. He's he he a I love you. I love all you guys. You are a cute man. Sorry, sorry. No, 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 no. So, what was the most insane thing you ever had to deal with with kids on the set? Uh, I had this. Uh, we we did a a scene. Uh, like multiple takes of a scene where the character just had to like enter a room and sit down. Yeah. Uh, and he was probably like you 10, can't even stand up. Ten or twelve. Yeah. We did so many takes. It was like our fault. Oh, she was like ten or twelve years old. Okay. Yeah, real young. And uh, more than twelve takes. And uh, like like two thirds of the way through, um, uh, we realized we were standing, you know, standing behind camera that that he's like a big wet spot in his jeans. Oh. Oh. He pissed himself, but it was like really. So you're like, you're fired, get off the set. Exactly. And that's two guys. <laughs> Strike three, you go home. No, no what happened? Uh, I don't remember, but somehow we like we, we, we made him feel okay about it and uh, and uh, dried his pants a little. And, uh, now that's something like George Lucas and Steven five, Spielberg six. probably don't have to deal with too often. No. It's like, oh, Brad Pitt shit himself again. <laughs> Call the word, man. No. They're outside telling Brad shit. That's <laughs> fine. Um, but, but anyways, um, I'm like, well, people, people, I, 
I used to think I was like Tom Cruise, but some people sound like Tom Lewis. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm Tom Lewis, with no respect. But you're a young professor. Okay, so you're a professor. A lot of people may or may not know this. Professor. At, John, at Johns I'm Hopkins. A young professor. No, no, you are. How old are you? How old are you? Because you look like. I turn 34 next week. Wow. Hey, I'm 32. And I look like I can be your dad. That's crazy. But um, that'd be a weird dad. Young dad. That could be a movie. Thank you. <laughs> Well, now, um, I noticed also in your movies, like, now, have, I don't know if you got, a lot of you guys have seen Hamilton or Buddy Hill, but there's a lot of, like, tribal-esque kind of ritualistic partying going on. Like, you got, like, a karaoke funeral party. There's a tattoo party. There's, like, paintball war, which has, like, great, like, sound effects. Um, what are these kind of seemingly more relaxed kind of party scenes? It seems like the characters, like, what, does, what do those scenes bring out? Like, what do you intend and what are you trying to display? Because it seems purposeful in those types of scenes where we're like, they're actually partying in the non-serious scenes. Yeah, I like that, that it's like tribal. ritualistic tribal. Yeah, because it is tribal, because the paintball thing, they're in the woods, and that's kind of tribal. And that could be like, <laughs> white people, that could be any kind of people. And <laughs> tattoo parties, any type of person can get a tattoo. Yeah. Paintball, everybody plays paintball and karaoke. We all like to sing about the moon and the tuna and the spring. <laughs> but now, what are you trying to bring out with that type of like, um, in, in those scenes? Um, I think like, community, I'm interested in I guess all my films are about community, but it's like a community you build, less the like community through family, even though that's, I guess, interesting too. Um, well, in Putty Hill, it's kind of a, an awkward ragtag community, and it's like they're really disenfranchised, and they're not really, they don't really connect emotionally, but when they're playing, like they connect, like there's a bonding in play that they don't have in real life. And in their creative life. Like one of the things about Putty Hill I love so much is that everybody's like making something like, really make something cool, uh, whether, you know, whether they're like skating or BMXing or, like, uh, or, or, or making music or, or uh, taking photographs or whatever. Well, it's funny because there's the community, like, in the, like when the guy's like skateboarding in Putty Hill, he's at the skate park, there's like that sense of family and community, but he doesn't have it with his own family. So it's kind of like the juxtaposition. But I love the karaoke scene in Putty Hill. It's, it, it's pretty poignant, man. Like, I was watching the movie, um, and let me tell you, it was like somebody, somebody was cutting onions right next to me or something. Because I started, this guy started crying. And uh, my girlfriend luckily fell asleep so she didn't see that. <laughs> I'll never see it, bro. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless it's planned. Yeah, I, but, but no, no, it's a really poignant scene. And it's like, there is this um, catharsis that the character has singing this Dolly Parton song. This emotional outburst that's been, she can't display it at any other point in the movie. Like, there's a funeral. There's all these serious conversations. She sees a grandmother who's like on death's door, but the only time that she has this emotional kind of release is singing a karaoke song, and I think it's such a beautiful kind of moment. And actually, I'd like to show that clip. This is from Putty Hill. And what's the character's Thanks. name? Oh, Sky. Um, Jenny is the character, Sky. Yeah, Friar. a great freaking scene, man. Yeah, awesome, I mean. Thanks. Uh, do we have that clip? Uh, here we go. Make out with 
the Indigo Girls are Barney, the purple dinosaur. The Indigo Girls. Indigo Girls, hey! Indigo Girls. If they run that like that too much, don't tell your students, no. Uh, anyways, uh, would you rather get a lap dance from Madeline Albright or a full body massage with oils from the two brothers of Kartok? Like Kartok. Kartok, yeah! And uh, my last question, would you rather dress like a belly dancer and sneak into bed with Greg Araki or punch Wilford Brimley in the face while wearing nothing but a tool belt? Diabetes. <laughs> Greg Araki. Greg Araki. Hey! Ladies and gentlemen, Matt